I'm really quite excited to be uh, with you guys in Dublin uh, for, th well, actually three reasons. The first is I'm a big fan of the Engineers Without Borders movement around the world. I think it's really, really important. And so coming together and these events like this, these rather sort of um, important legal formal events, I, I think is, you know, um, quite important. And I'm really sort of pleased to see the EWB movement growing in Ireland. So thank you for inviting me. A second reason is that we actually, uh, Field Ready and Engineers Without Borders Ireland are in the process of arranging for some of the Where There Is No Engineer Challenge winners to spend some time in our programs that we set up in Kathmandu in Nepal after the earthquakes in 2015. And the third reason is that this is my first trip to Ireland since you guys very kindly gave me nationality here. So um, thank you for being my lifeboat from Brexit Britain. And uh, my granddad, who's from Cavan, um, and who got married and uh, had the honeymoon in this city, would be very pleased. Um, so thank you. I was very happy to use my Irish passport for the first time on this trip today. Um, so I've, I've sort of, um, I walked into this room and thought this, this is such a lovely space. There's a workshop I'd like to quickly do. So I'm going to actually spend less time talking about Field Ready and then try and squeeze in a workshop and not interfere with Olivia's presentation too much, hopefully. And we'll do some Q&A after the, after the, the workshop. Uh, is that all right? Good, because that's what's going to happen. Because I went out shopping for biscuits and towels to make the workshop happen. And Emergence is um, uh, something that happens in complex systems, in complex environments, complex contexts, not necessarily the kind of context that engineers are trained for, because we're trained to be very linear, very project orientated in our work. Um, but increasingly, the problems that we're facing, such as the SDGs, are non linear. So, what we have to do is to create the conditions for solutions to emerge emergence. So this idea of sort of being able to engineer emergence it, even in places like Syria um, is, is more about sort of putting is that building capacity idea that Declan talked about in the introduction. So um, oh the quality is a bit poor isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, since I thought, I thought I'd mention Nepal since we're going to be working with Engineers Without Borders Ireland there. These are the kind of stories that emerged in the media after the earthquakes in 2015, late like April and early May 2015. And basically, you know, aid piling up at the airport, the tarmac of the only international airport in the country was being damaged because the planes were coming in too heavy, full of aid. Um, you know, you know, systems, systems have failed, failed. You, can't you can't get, get um, aid out into the hills even by yak, because all the roads have collapsed and landslides and so on. 60 to 80% of all of the income that goes into humanitarian relief is spent on buying stuff and moving stuff, depending on the year, depending on where it is. Um, uh, the budget's actually increased since this research was done. Uh, the annual aid budget is, I think, around 25 billion dollars a year now, um, just looking at aid agencies. Um, and one of the defining characteristics of, the, of a disaster, in fact, you know, of disasters generally is severe logistical challenges. But the point is, there are always local capabilities. And so one of the things that Field Ready is trying to do is to line up some of the more high-tech technologies that engineers are used to, working, used to working with, perhaps in places like Dublin, with some of these severe logistical challenges so that we can make things locally. And doing things faster, if you can make it locally, you don't need to ship. You don't need to bring it in. You can often be better than the standard aid products because you can customize to the individual, for example, or you can make improvements and, and spare parts, and you can often be a hell of a lot cheaper because the supply chains are often so expensive. So we're trying to go from the typical aid supply chain, which might look like something like this, 
to something that looks a bit more like this and actually manufacturing in communities and then trying to scale that up, networking together, manufacturing capacity, uh, basically you know just creating connections between people or, but also sort of sharing design files openly or um, you know other sort of capacity building work so that we can create what uh, the core of our innovation is which we call networked local manufacturing and we're trying to bring this change into the aid sector it is absolutely crazy that we're shipping stuff <laughs> around the world into these disaster zones we're shipping we're, you know we're trying to ship stuff into Bangladesh which is one of the manufacturing hubs of the planet like and it's just because of the heritage that we've had almost ever since the Industrial Revolution, but also because of the way logistics in the aid sector has been built up. Um, and it's actually quite, a, those bureaucracies can be quite hard to change. The most beneficial areas for local manufacturing are in prototypes um, to show people how to make things themselves. Uh, repairs, fixes, spare parts that you otherwise can't get, they're unavailable on the market anymore customized parts uh, to individual people and also making the molds needed for mass production these are bars of soap with little uh, animals toy animals inside them to encourage children to wash their hands which is quite important at the moment and we don't really have a linear process this is a sort of misleading image in some ways because um, local manufacturing making stuff with people lends itself to an iterative process. So we do assess, design, make uh, a couple of times in a couple of hours. You go from identifying a problem that someone's having to, you know, potentially a 3D printed object with a prototype pr stage in between very quickly. And then we share our designs, we publish them openly, we deliver training courses, and then we come and do talks like this to try and encourage people to change the world. Um, this is Addie, uh, and she's in an evacuation, the building behind is an evacuation center for the Ambai earthquake in Vanuatu, uh, Ambai volcano in Vanuatu. Ambai is an island in um, the Pacific Ocean, part of the network of islands that make up the country of Vanuatu. The volcano erupted, the government evacuated the island, a lot of the people didn't really have anywhere to go. This was a recently Chinese built as yet unused cruise ship terminal. Just imagine like a empty airport terminal, but you know, no furniture whatsoever. And all of the most vulnerable people, uh, pe pregnant women, very old people, people with disabilities, people with mental health problems were put into that place so they could be cared for. The problem is they didn't have any furniture. The aid agencies were trying to procure furniture, which meant shipping beds from China, $180 a pop was never going to happen. Addy w walked down to the local hardware store, 600 meters away. Can we borrow some materials? <laughs> I mean, in the end, we literally just borrowed them. We did a bit of prototyping, a bit of consultation. Uh, what we realized was they didn't actually want beds. That was the wrong specification to be designing a solution for. What they wanted was not to sleep on the floor. So we actually just borrowed planks of wood, plywood, and some concrete blocks, and then put these battens up with these um, blankets. They were only there for six weeks. When the evacuation was over and people returned to the island, all of those, all of those materials went back on the shelves in the hardware store. We came up with a design which meant you didn't need to cut or you didn't need to drill or anything. So all of those materials went back on the hardware store's shelves, and the hardware store was happy to help a lot cheaper than $180 a bed. Really important to build skills, so, you know, um, this is Abby, one of our uh, engineers, field engineers, training a local woman how to use vernier calipers, calipers to take measurements, because we were in her community taking measurements, and it just looks like a weird, they've never seen that activity before, so, you know, it should be something that anybody could do. So the idea is, is that we show the head of the women's group what we're doing um, and hopefully make it, some, make it more reasonable as it could be something that they could do as well. Um, remote 
uh, 3D printing and IDB camps, uh, fixing spare parts for water pumping stations in Nepal, engaging with people directly on what kind of products they need, um, helping local entrepreneurs make things like medical devices and maker spaces, um, going out into the field with your 3D printer in the back, um, helping local entrepreneurs prototype to then enable mass production. This guy got an order for 120,000 cook stoves, I think it was, based off a mold on a single 3D print, doing training, out in the field, it's really important to show people that we can run our printers off, 3D, off solar panels because it's always a question that comes up. Um, but the idea is make it locally and trying to train local people like Osama. He didn't actually need much training. He's, he's in Idlib in Syria at the moment. Absolutely incredible engineers in Syria and he's one of them and he um, set up a workshop on a project with us did some prototyping, developed some designs for heavy lift airbags, did some testing, actually we did the, a lot of the testing in Istanbul, and uh, came up with these products, which are, are basically using the materials you can find as a truck stop. If you can see at the back, just above his bum there, you put the airbag into the building, you inflate the airbag, you lift up the collapsed building, and you can pull out the people who are trapped inside all made with local materials, nothing shipped in, all the designs are open source, you could go on tonight and download them if you want to make them yourselves. They come with a health warning, because if these things blow up, <laughs> uh, you've got to make sure they're really, really well made. So quality control is one of the challenges if you're trying to make things locally. But by doing things like that, you can be essentially cheaper, better, faster, and supporting local businesses. In the future, we can imagine the idea of, you know, you've got your spare parts up in the Himalayas, the thing that's, that's, that you've got your broken part in the Hi Himalayas, a drone comes and picks it up, takes it to the local makerspace, make up a new version, take, take the drone back again. We're, connect, we're creating an internet of production uh, by creating standards to try and um, move not just the humanitarian sector but manufacturing generally from this sort of globalized mass manufacturing to a localized decentralized manufacturing by the masses. That's the kind of vision of the future that we're trying to instill. You can sign up uh, and we do, yes, yeah, so data standards and things like that we're developing to underpin all of that. Um, I want to quickly run through, by the way that's the fastest I've ever done that presentation. So if it's overwhelming and stuff, I apologize, but the game is quite fun. So we're going to concentrate on that. Humanitarian relief, unlike um, poverty reduction, development, capacity building type change, um, requires a, a different kind of accountability. And there are all sorts of different sources of law that humanitarian respond responders have to adhere to, but also codes of conduct, such as the Red Cross Code of Conduct, the SPHERE guidelines, um, and, and essentially the underpinning principles are humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. And if you're part of the Red Cross movement, you might also sign up to these as well. Voluntary service, for example, means you cannot be ordered. If you're a humanitarian worker, you're not working necessarily for a company that's told you to go on pain of losing your job, or a military government agency that's told you to go on pain of you no know, court martial or whatever. Um, it's voluntary. Um, but humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence are the governing ideas behind humanitarianism. Um, and really, there's all these policy frameworks coming up, but the thing that Engineers Without Borders is really helping with and changing in the world is this idea, through things like the um, Where There Is No Engineer Challenge, is really helping to introduce new kinds of, um, of, of thinking, of understanding, being able to meet the world on its own terms to recognize when you're operating in a complex or chaotic non-linear domain and quite frankly capacity building as opposed to a project might be more useful for example it's a way of sort of 
being able to create, as we're doing in manufacturing, more adaptive responses that, that you know, can change. We don't turn up in a disaster response knowing what we're going to make, knowing what, what we're going to supply. What we turn up with is the capability, and we try and very quickly identify local capabilities to be able to respond to whatever comes up day by day, hour by hour. I think I've already talked about this. That is the um, shipping of a bucket for the Nepal earthquake. There are plenty of bucket making factories in Nepal. Uh, right, the game. So basically I walked in the room and thought I'd really like to do a workshop that I used to do quite a bit with um, Engineers Without Borders and it's about exploring the concept of what it is to be without borders. Would you mind all standing up and joining over here, please? <laughs> so, would you like to volunteer to describe what your team did? When I said ready, study, go. Or even before that, what happened? We didn't empower this person. We didn't what? Empower the person. Oh, already jumped into it. More specifically, <laughs> what, what, what actually did they do? Describe the practical things that happened when, when I said. Those the rules of the game. That's on their own. On their own? Yeah, ask for more rules. Ask for more rules? Mm -hmm. They did it themselves. Did, did, did what themselves? They, they got the biscuits themselves and gave it to Got the biscuits themselves yeah. and gave, yeah? Mm -hmm. What else happened? They didn't even plan. They decided what they were going to do together. They what? They decided what they were going to do together. They didn't plan. Thank you. My hearing's a bit, because they haven't popped from the aeroplane, so sorry. <laughs> A um, bit more detail. Let's really get into this. What what actually happened? In your, in, let's describe, when, go through what this team actually did. Communicated. Yeah. When? Mm, when we had to. <laughs> Sorry, is the question to that side alone or this side as well? This side. At the moment. No, I mean like uh, the... Uh, we'll do a compare and contrast. Okay. Yeah. Do you, want to, do you want to describe what they did? No, no, I'm, I'm asking whether you're asking those guys to uh, uh, answer. I'm asking or, those guys to answer, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> well, what I tell you what I thought. I saw, yeah, feel free. Um, I saw... Uh, did you both walk up? Yeah. Did you yeah. both walk up? Yeah. But one of you picked it up, not you didn't both pick it up. Well, you, I was going to go up and then you said, oh, it took about three seconds and then uh, you said, oh, gosh. Yeah. Which, which would confuse me. Okay. And then you put the biscuit in to, um, your mouth and you, and you ate it? And then I paid it. Okay. Then what happened? What did you start doing after that? Took off the... Um, not, not like I saw them do, do with her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so you saw what was happening over there and you yeah, decided to... But I just remember that you'd said, uh, get him to put, or then put the bits in their mouth. Okay, so, yeah, that's so, yeah. that 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 yeah. the, the importance of every single word in mm -hmm. the instructions, yeah. Can someone describe what this group did, step by step? Uh, they, so, they kind of looked at the situation. Yes. I suppose who was in vulnerable position. Yeah. And then yeah. instead of kind of assessing it with the being the vulnerable person, they knew what had to be done, just like in the Nepal earthquake. And so they came over here for the focus, essentially. Yeah. And then they went back when it actually they dived straight this into very it. deep, you're getting very into it. Well <laughs> done, <laughs> <laughs> they dived straight So in. the same thing more or less happened, which was that one of you came to collect it. Mm. What did this guy do? He tried to sabotage the other team. Oh, I was going to help him. <laughs> you were helping them. I was helping you. Okay. Okay. It was hard to tell that you were helping. Did you tell her that you were going to get the biscuits? Did you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, did, you knew you were getting yeah, the biscuits. You went over there and came back instead of me okay. just going over there. Well done. Okay. Did they, did they ask you what, you what you wanted them to do or did, you, did they tell you yeah. what they were going to do? 
Oh, yeah, I don't remember, but I, I <laughs> that, that, we, we tried to discuss it. Yeah, answer. that's what should have happened. Yeah. No, we just got. Okay. I, don't know. I would actually take more time. Were they allowed to take the yeah. time? Yeah. I didn't give any rules. But there's the guy. I said, I want people to eat biscuits, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, the instructions you gave yeah. was to uh, uh, give uh, biscuits yeah. to the two people who are blindfolded. Yeah. And I think you give uh, 60, uh, 60 uh, seconds exactly. for that to be done. So uh, the uh, one of the two, well actually one of, uh, one of them first took uh, uh, a shot. I don't know whether it's part of it. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then... It's uh, nice to see we have some uh, photographers around. <laughs> yeah. Thank and you. then uh, the, uh, his colleague went to uh, bring the biscuits. Yeah. And when he got him back, the blindfold was... Uh, 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 removed, yeah. and a uh, visit was given to her. The blindfold first, was it? Yeah. 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 Mm. No, it was there. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, yeah. the hands yeah. were yeah. Okay. Yeah. and then the blindfold before the biscuits was given to her. Thank you. Let I should have just walked over there. They should have just taken my body photo. But you were tied up. Yeah, yeah, but they could have just taken them off and I would have gone I there. I didn't realize that they Now they see. went there. It's almost and like you had borders that needed to be removed. <laughs> <laughs> that you needed to become without borders of some kind. Yeah. Um, I'm going to really dig into this yeah. horrendous <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> Shouldn't the girl, like, I thought that the girl was going to be helped, you know, assisted to come here. Because you didn't tell, you didn't tell it was great. I did say when he said he go, so you know, and there is a there is a human behaviour that kicks in to think that everything is a race, everything is competition. But yeah, you're actually. But I really thought that she was going, you know, like hopping with their assistance. And the thing, the thing is, because you said that she had to pick up the biscuits. Well, I said to eat the biscuits. Yeah. But the thing is, you were being tied up before you could see where the biscuits were going, yeah. sort of thing. But so, they could help. We, we tried right. to discuss the options to see which one would be better. So we did yeah. discuss that option. And what, what was your definition of better? Of better, yeah. We, we weren't sure, thing. but we thought, we thought there was a, a risk that we wouldn't get it complete in time if we were carrying the person over there. Great. So we decided, no, that's, that's not so good. Um, so you Sean, took, Sean you took the low risk that. risk option, we thought. which is do it yourself, because you have control over yourself, not necessarily of anything else in the context. Yeah. Thank you. How did you feel when you were tied up? Fine. <laughs> did you know what? I'm going to have to really spell this out. Um, did you know what was going on? Uh, tunics, no, not not 100%, tunic, tunic stands but not completely. And there was a level of, uh, well, I guess I wasn't in in my complete zone, I guess there was, I, I didn't have like complete mobility. Yeah. I was restricted. Did, did you feel like, was that a very comfortable situation for you to be in? Did you want to, did you want to have been put in that situation after you found out what you were mm. signed up for? <laughs> uh, like, yeah. I didn't mind too much, but yeah, no. All right. Like the yeah, other man's question. Okay. To, to make it How did you feel? Um, I I would say the same way, but interestingly, I I felt very comfortable until my feet were tied together. Okay. If I were blindfolded and had my hands on my neck, I would be fine. I was like, I could I could do this. Yeah. But with the feet, I couldn't walk, okay. and I would be very likely to trip. Yeah. And so to me, that was very restraining. That's a very trust. That's why. I didn't know that I could be untied, so I asked them if they could get okay. the biscuits. But that seemed to be the safest option for me as well, but I didn't know that they could. Who are these two? People I represent in this place. The people in the park? Or the affected people, people affected by poverty or disaster? Who are the people helping them? Major workers. Major workers. People like members of engineers of that board. Who am I? I'm the one that provided you biscuits. I'm, 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 in, this, in this case, I'd like to think of myself as the donor. I took my 10% overhead since I was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where did the biscuits end up as of interest? I, I, oh, yeah. 
Yeah. What do the what do the biscuits represent? Eight. Yeah. Where did the eight end up? Some of it ended up. Also, I didn't say which biscuits you had to get. There was a really nice pack of boxes. We we actually discussed that. That was discussed. And who are you guys? Other affected people. Other affected people. The general public. Potentially people who had much better ideas of what these organisations should do to respond than the organisations do. Yeah? Who's this guy? CNN. Um, right. Thank you. The whole thing is a big metaphor. And the first time I played this game, coming back to the government, it goes back to the people having money in the boat. The first time I did this game, it was on a, and it's of course a facile uh, thing to do to try and compare all of the world's problems as a blindfold, or as, you know, bits of towers to come up, all of the barriers that people have back It's got a facile thing to do, but the reason I, I feel I can um, do that is because I spent a month learning about participatory development in India with communities. We played this game at the end of that month. This was in 2005, before I um, started working for International Borders. Um, and what we did, I was one of the aid workers, and what we did in our team is after doing a month's worth of training on participatory development, me and my aid worker friend, we went and talked to each other in the corner like this to make a plan. We lifted the person up and we ran with them. <laughs> Grab the biscuits, smashed it over, up over our knees, biscuits flying everywhere, put it in the mouth. We've won. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> what is the simplest, the most simple way of achieving what I was saying? You were the first to speak. Of what I was saying, what was the what the rules of the game were? What was the most simple way of achieving? I'm powerless. I'm powerless. I in this, yeah, removing the, the ties. Even simpler than that. What would you do first? Communicate. Form them. But they have, what action would you take first? Take off their blindfold. Their blindfold? Potentially. Maybe they don't want to look at you lot. What's going on? The simplest way to solve the problem that I can think of is to untie the hands, and then they can decide if they untie themselves the rest of the time. So it's often, it taught me about the idea, and there's absolutely no, um, thank you for participating, there's no shame in any of this, because the, there's, the, you know, I spent a month doing this, and that was my response. Like, I have never, I've done this game maybe, 50 times. I've never seen anyone untie the hands first. We are trained in the West to think in terms of competition, in terms of projects, in terms of following rules, even when there aren't any and we have to kind of ask for more rules, as, you're, as you were saying. Um, and the thing about the Without Borders movement and some of the philosophy that goes with it for me is not necessarily that where I thought it started, which was about going to other countries and going across national boundaries. It wasn't even about sort of, um, uh, you know, overcoming technological barriers or building skills and doing capacity building necessarily. It was finding that one thing that you wanted to remove. Ultimately, for me, it became about sort of um, 
this idea about a new way of thinking of rejecting the game if you have to. And you know, finding the what's the one thing that you can do that will make a difference, the simplest thing that you can do when you're face to face with people who might be asking for assistance. Now I didn't actually ask you if you wanted help, I set that up because it's a game. I uh, don't even know if you like biscuits or if they're culturally appropriate to you. But anyway, if you need gluten free biscuits, then I'm really sorry. You could ask me if I like chocolate biscuits. Oh, right, okay. So, not lactose intolerant. Um, and the idea for me now is very much about trying to engage, not so much in trying to um, the uh, in sort of trying to install technology or, or set it up for the for um, the sake of it. Or it's all it's more about sort of embracing the world as it is and recognizing the complexity is there rather than trying to projectize it, linearize it with all of these equations and management tools that we've taught in engineering school. And um, more about sort of a more human, more humanitarian way of engaging. And the reason I play this game is because whenever I'm in that sort of situation, I remember this game and I think my default behavior is to think of the competition, to think of the race, to think, to treat it like a project. And I, and I always kind of stop myself from my instincts that I learned in university and as sort an of engineer growing up playing Lego and Meccano and whatever, and try to think what is the without borders way of doing it. And that goes back to what Declan was saying at the very start of the AGM today. Should we sit down? Thank you very much. You know, this is the paradigm of things in the physical world. Uh, Neo-Newtonian practice. This, th this is the reason why aeroplanes fly and everything, because we know exactly the, how every rivet performs. This is what engineers have to be really good at to be professionals. But we also need to have behaviours of adaptive pluralism to be able to find different ways of working. Um, all of these slides will be available. I'll, you can send them around. To recognize which domain you're working in. Are you working in a non-linear domain where you have to act and see what happens or where you have to try things out and see what happens, see how the system responds? Or is it as linear as a light switch where you do the same thing twice and you get the same result? That doesn't happen when you go from one pilot project to the next. <laughs> You know, the one village to the next, the project changes. Or if it's complicated, engineers are basically all about trying to work in that domain up there. With all of our second order, dif order differential equations and Fourier transforms, it's all about linearizing within certain bounds a nonlinear world. There are techniques like variety engineering, uh, which is about the relationship between a system and its controllers, and the viable systems model, which is looking at um, the, the sustainability of any system, no matter where you draw the boundary. So there's all sorts of things you can learn about this. The idea is, ultimately, to try and help everyone to realize their own recovery. And I think what Engineers Without Borders is doing with the Where There Is No Engineer Challenge is essentially introducing some of this mindset, even if perhaps this, these sorts of theory that I've just raced through isn't in the curriculum, curriculum yet, at least getting people to be in a disposition where they can embrace this sort of stuff. So for that reason, I'm very grateful to Engineers Without Borders for the work it does here. And I'm very happy to share these slides so you can look more into some of that theory and uh, some of the non-linear, how you handle non-linear situations. Um, but if you have any questions on that, how much time do I have?